I was born about 50 miles south of Dublin, and I'm the oldest of 13 children. While attending business college in Ireland, I became addicted to gambling, which left me depressed and eventually suicidal. Out of desperation, I I went into the local church in my hometown and sat in the back pew and called out to God and said, God, if you're real, save me. And the scriptures tell us that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the problem was, I didn't know that scripture. I didn't, I didn't know anyone who knew the Bible. I didn't know anybody who was born again. And so I had to take a boat to England, a train to Dover, a boat to Belgium, and a train to Stuttgart, Germany, in order for someone to share the gospel with me. I often think how unfair that is, that someone has to leave their country and travel thousands of miles in order to hear the gospel for the first time. Ireland needs the gospel. Out of a population of 6.3 million people, it's estimated that 100,000 are born again. And the land that was known as the land of saints and scholars. In 2013, Ireland was put on a list. A list of the top 10 atheist countries in the world. One in five Irish people claim to no longer believe in God. God has given us a heart for Ireland and God has called us to go back and be a witness to those who need Jesus. Wow. Amen. You know, I I tell people I come from a small Irish family because we had neighbors who had 21 kids and Neighbors with 18 kids, so uh, we were, we were, we were, uh, you know, but we were probably one of the biggest, obviously, families in the area. But um, yeah, it's, and, and the interesting thing is, our first term, uh, we went back to uh, an Assembly of God church in my hometown. Uh, it didn't exist when I was growing up, uh, but about 20 years ago, the church was planted, and we were a part of that church for our first term. I was the community care pastor. Michelle oversaw the nursery and coordinated just uh, some good uh, policies for the nursery. And um, uh, I was the community care pastor. So I kind of connected the church with the community. You know, and we, and we sang uh, a song uh, this morning. You are all together uh, worthy. You're all together lovely. You're all together wonderful to me. And I just have sang that song many times, but it really ministered to me this morning because it reminded me that altogether God is lovely, altogether He's worthy, altogether He's wonderful, because there's issues and challenges in our life that it doesn't look like this is true, but when we see it working all together, it comes out. Wow, how wonderful he is to me. And I wanted to just share a, a story. Uh, so, again, I was the community care pastor at the church. And I don't know if you know this, but the second most spoken language in Ireland is Polish. We have, we have about 100,000 Polish people living in Ireland. And we had just got to the church. We were maybe two weeks. And I was talking to some of the guys outside the building and introducing myself. And I met this guy named Rick. And Rick was just a little bit older than me. And uh, he was from Poland. And I found out he wasn't even really a part of the church. He just happened to be there that Sunday. And so uh, as I got to know him, I found out he had cancer. And uh, he had it pretty bad. So I said, Rick, I'll walk with you. You know, uh, I'll visit you in the, in the hospital when you have your surgeries, when you come home. Uh, you know, I'll visit you, come to our house. So we, we did this. And uh, as I got to know Rick, uh, he had no friends. He was estranged from everyone. He was even estranged from his 87-year-old mother in Poland. And she would call and he would not answer the phone. Uh, something had happened in the past over a bicycle, right? And, uh, he, you know, he was promised a bicycle. He was saving for the bicycle. And uh, his parents took that money and bought something else, you know, when he was just a teenager, right? And so 
he held that on for, for all these years. So anyway, uh, I would walk with him through the cancer treatments. And um, he, uh, he asked me a favor. He said, Patrick, you know, if, if I die, uh, I'd like to be cremated and my ashes spread in Ireland. And then I'd like you to call my mother. I said, Rick, I can't really do that. That's, that's not really nice to, to just keep your mother out of the picture. And he said, but he pushed back and he said, no, I, I really don't want nothing to do with her. And I found out, like, you know, only was he estranged from his family, but he was also estranged from God. He didn't really have a relationship with God because of just issues in his past. So he, he, Rick had a bucket list. There were certain things he wanted to do while he was somewhat healthy. He wanted to go to London and Edinburgh and just, like, you know, see museums, take pictures. But the biggest thing he wanted to do was he wanted to go to Israel. I don't know necessarily why, but he wanted to go to Israel. And I said, Rick, I've never been to Israel. I'll take you. Now, you're, you're paying for your own ticket, Rick, but I'm, I'll take you, you know. I just want to make sure. Uh, and so he said, you would? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take you. And I, I took my, my son Liam uh, with us. So we, I bought the tickets online, uh, booked the uh, hotel, the, the car rental. And uh, we were to leave on uh, November, uh, Friday, the, November the 13th, uh, 2015, right? And he reminded me later that you booked the tickets for Friday the 13th. Uh, <laughs> So he's so excited, he, he doesn't sleep uh, the night uh, before, and we pick him up at 5.30 in the morning. Now, we're taking a two-hour bus to Dublin Airport, and then we're going to fly on uh, to Israel. Well, uh, it's 5.30 in the morning, it's, it's dark, it's uh, raining, typical Irish weather, and we pick him up, we go to the bus stop, and it's a bus going to the airport, so everybody's got luggage. So uh, we're putting our bags on the bus. This lady comes beside me, she's got four bags, and uh, I say, well, we'll help you put the bags on. You know, it's raining. You can get into the bus. And so I said, Rick, let's, let's help the lady with the bags. And as we're putting the bags on the bus, Rick has his medicine bag, his morphine. And uh, he puts the morphine bag beside the bus. And when we get on the bus, he forgets the morphine. So we're on the bus like two minutes. And he says, my my medicine. I said, what are you talking about? He says, yeah, I put it down beside the bus and uh, I can't survive for more than two days without this medicine. So uh, I, I called Michelle because she had dropped us off at the bus stop. I said, Michelle, can you go by and uh, check if the bag was there? And the bag was stolen. Someone stole all the, the medicine. And we called the police station. Nobody reported it. And so now it's a two-hour bus ride up to the airport. And, uh, like, I'm just devastated. I said, God, you know, we, this all happened because I tried to help someone. If I hadn't helped them, this wouldn't have happened. So, like, you know, what's going on? I said, God, could you put the medicine in the other bag uh, that's already on the bus? And I'm just down on my knees, like, just praying, God, help us. Well, we get to the bus, uh, get to the airport. I said, Rick, check the other bag. And, of course, there's no medicine. So Rick can't come with us. He used to take the next bus back to my home town. So we go on, we do, me and Liam, we do uh, the Israel uh, trip. Come back. I'm just devastated, you know, about all this happening. Well, uh, you know, Rick uh, declines, and he ends up in hospice. But uh, a lot of people in the church were, were starting to really pray for him, and he reconciles to God. And then he reconciles to his mother. He calls his mother in Poland, and he's weeping, and he's just, you know, just, you know, reconciling to her. That she came over for about four days and spent some good quality time with him. Um, amazing woman, 87 years of age. Found out she had a heart attack uh, on the plane going back, you know, but survived. Um, so, I mean, just even though she was, you know, frail, she really wanted to be with her son. Well, he, he, he is now in hospice. I get a call. F uh, well, he's okay with his, when his mom's there, but he, he declines then, and he ends up in, in hospice. And he, uh, the, the nurse calls me, and she says, he's not going to make it through the night. And um, so we're there with him when he passes on. And uh, a couple of hours later, the doctor comes to certify the body. And she doesn't know who I am. I'm just kind of sitting there. And she says, you know, uh, I can't believe he, he died so quickly. But uh, he had come to me a couple of months ago, and he had this crazy idea. He wanted to go to Israel. I said, Rick, you can't go to Israel. 
uh, your chest is so bad. He says, no, I want to go. Can you just sign off that I can go? And she said, I don't really want to do this. He says, no, I really want to go to Israel. He says, okay, Rick, I, I'll sign off on it. But I'm telling you, you won't survive the plane trip because your chest is so bad. And then I realized why the bag was stolen. Right? Because God cared more about Rick's salvation that he was reconciled to Jesus and he was reconciled to his mother than anything else in the world. I just say that because at the time, it didn't look like God was doing anything. But the Bible says that all things work to good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Amen. So I just say that to encourage us. Like, you know, things happen in our life. And we say, is this God? Well, God is able to even work these things out according to his plan. Amen. That's the, that's the God that we serve. And so even through Rick's funeral, we got the opportunity to share a, a, the gospel with a lot of his friends, you know, people that, in the Polish community uh, that came to the funeral. And uh, so I just want to just share that because at the time, I was like, God, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. But it actually was the best thing that could ever happen. Amen. Because Rick's now in heaven and he's, uh, he's doing well, you know. Uh, so when we, when we uh, return in August, so we're, we're home itinerating, uh, we're going to work with a new church plant that started in Dublin. Because if you saw the video uh, of 6.3 million people, approximately 100,000 are born again. So that's uh, uh, between 1 and 2% of the population is evangelical. And so there's vast areas of the country that there's no evangelical witness. And uh, even uh, for for the Catholic uh, faith, they're seeing a drastic decline in numbers. Uh, they say in the city, it's down to about 3% attending uh, church. When I was a kid, it was 95%. Uh, so in, in one generation, it's, it's de declined drastically. And that's because people are really disillusioned uh, with a lot of things that have happened in the church. And then we have the influ influence of secularism. And so when we, when we go back, we're going to be working with this new church plant. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to partner with the community and, uh, you know, uh, do justly and, 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 uh, and love mercy and just, just connect with them and uh, just see if we can, we can find things that we have in common that we can do in order to earn the right to share the gospel with them. And I appreciate the, the church doing evangelism explosion because... Uh, I serve on the Evangel Evangelism Explosion Leadership in Ireland, and uh, we do it I at Linfield. Uh, so on Thursday nights, about 10 teams go out uh, from the church in Linfield, and then on Tuesday night, I just started going over to um, Lemonster, and I'm taking two people out and showing them how to, to begin the ministry. So, uh, so it's a great ministry if you're just feeling if uh, you should do it. Uh, I, I think everybody should do it. Every should, everybody should be shamed, uh, share, um, trained in personal evangelism. Amen? Uh, and so, uh, we, again, we hope to go back in August, and uh, we're very excited about uh, this new ad adventure. It, the church meets in the movie theater, and it seems to really work because, you know, there's a lot of barriers that people won't cross over, and they won't necessarily go into a Protestant church, or well, what they consider a Protestant church, but they will go into a movie theater. And so people have actually gone to see a movie and found the church and, uh, and even found the Lord. So God works in mysterious ways, amen? So praise God. And I just appreciate you know, your church and uh, you know, your heart for missions. And I just want to just encourage you from uh, Philippians chapter 4, if you could turn there. And I gave everybody a, um, a shamrock. Right? If you don't have a shamrock, we have some extras here. There's, there's someone to see, but, uh, and hopefully you have a pen. All right, because I'd like to uh, just look at this portion of Scripture in Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 10 to 20. And it's a, it's a, a thank you letter that Paul uh, writes to the Philippian church for their partnership and, and helping him to reach th the ends of the earth. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful encouragement uh, and a challenge to us. So I'd like to uh, I read it from the uh, NIV. Um, you know, uh, we didn't grow up 
uh, with a Bible in her home, and so uh, I didn't even know a Bible verse, didn't even know John 3.16, and someone gave me a Bible and said, Patrick, here's the NIV, and it stands for the New Ireland Version. <laughs> so I read from the, see, because I thought the King James was the British uh, version, and so the Irish had the NIV, so it just shows how much I knew. So this is what Paul writes here. He says, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you have had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content with ever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God. So I give everybody a shamrock for two reasons. One is because it's the national flower of Ireland, right? And then secondly, uh, tradition tells us that when St. Patrick uh, was explaining the Trinity, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, and the Irish had no idea how to understand this, tradition tells us that he picked up a shamrock and he said, look, one flower, three leaves. You know, one God, three persons. And so, uh, and as some of you have shown me already, uh, I, I give these out, ask you to write a couple of words on it, and then hopefully you can uh, keep it, make it a prayer, and uh, like some people, it could be three, four years later, and they say, oh, I still have the shamrock. So, uh, so I want you to kind of, if you could write this word uh, over the, like the stem, right? Because I want you to leave the three leaves um, free so you can write something else on that. But if you can write this word, and it's the word renew, R-E-N-E-W, right? So in this portion of scripture, you know, it's a challenge to us because if we're going to see the ends of the earth reached with the gospel, uh, there are three things that the Holy Spirit has to renew in our lives. He has to renew it not only in our lives, but in the church, uh, in, in Christianity uh, in general. And so I want to look at these three things uh, that are found here in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, you know, I think the, the King James might say the word uh, revive, so either renew or revive. And uh, so these are the three things. I'd like you to write, uh, write them on the leaves, right? So, um, so the first one is, uh, renew my concern for the lost. All right? So obviously, if we're going to reach the ends of the earth, if we're going to reach this community, uh, the first thing that the Holy Spirit has to renew is my concern for the lost, right? And uh, this is what, uh, you know, we heard when we opened up the service, right? About thinking, you know, uh, am I the Pharisee or am I the tax collector, right? Uh, so, renew my concern for the lost. Now, here's the thing. If, if, we, if we were to ask ourselves, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much concern do I have for the lost, right? Now, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to tell me a number. Uh, but uh, just, just think of a number. What, what, what's, the, what's the number of my concern for the lost, right? Okay, now I want to give you, so you have a number. I want to give you the definition of concern, okay? See, Paul says here, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you have had no opportunity to show it, okay? So this word that Paul uses for concern has three factors. It's a concern that moves my conscience. It's a concern that moves my emotions. And it's a concern that, that moves my will. Okay? 
So my conscience is concerned about the lost. My emotions are concerned about the lost. And then, then my will is concerned. I'm, I'm going to do something, right? This is the concern uh, that Paul had that the Holy Spirit wants us to have for the lost, right? And if you just kind of listen to Romans chapter 9, I want to just read um, verses 1 to 3, and we see this concern uh, as expressed in Paul's life. Remember, this concern has three factors. It, it's a concern with my conscience. My conscience is bothered that there's lost people. My emotions are bothered that there's lost people. And my, my will, I, I want to really do something. Uh, and this is what Paul writes about his own concern. He says this in Romans 9, verses 1 to 3. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself was cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So, so notice, he, his conscience is moved, right? His emotions are moved. He, he, says, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And then his will is moved. Listen, his will is moved so much that he says to us, I would rather, be un I would rather lose my own salvation and everybody else be saved. That's, that's, that's a powerful will, right? And so, and so this is the kind of concern that uh, the Holy Spirit wants us to have for the lost. But you and I know that... That, that's not, so the enemy does not want us having that concern, right? right? And so he's got a number of strategies that he uses. And I think one of the things he uses is the media, right? You know, we can, we can, we can see a, a terrible disaster, right? And, uh, or we can, we can be told, uh, well, it's their own fault, right? Okay, uh, you know, and what, what that's doing is, is it's not allowing us to have the concern that God wants us to have uh, for all these people who are lost. So how do, I, how, do I, how do I have that concern? Let me just give you two quick things from this portion of Scripture. First of all, if I'm going to have a concern for the lost, the very first thing I must, I must do is I must always remember that I was lost myself once, Right? Because Paul says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. All right? In other words, you know, in the, if you are familiar with the Apostle Paul's writings, uh, you, you'll know that many times he shares his testimony. Okay? Many times he talks about what life was like for him before Christ, right? And he even said, I am the greatest of sinners, right? So Paul never forgot what it was like uh, to be unsaved. He never forgot. And I, I think, like, um, the longer we're Christians, the more likely we are to forget that we were lost ourselves once. Amen? I don't know if you've ever kind of noticed that, right? Uh, things that, uh, that chained you and uh, brought, brought you in, to a miserable place, uh, if they were 20 or 30 years ago, uh, you can almost forget that you were there yourself. Right? And so the first thing we, we sh must do is never forget, Lord, never let me forget what it was like to be lost. Right? Because Spurgeon said that evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Right? That, that, that's what it is. So, you know, we were lost ourselves one time. And the only difference between us and lost people is the grace of God. Right? So that's the, that's the first thing. We, we should never forget what it was like to be lost ourselves. Then the second thing, which is just as difficult, is that if we're going to have a concern for the lost, we have to strategically make friendships with lost people. Right? Because if I don't know anybody that's not saved on a, on a personal friendship level, 
I'm going to lose that concern for lost people, right? And so we have to strategically uh, be aware of who's lost around us and, uh, and build relationships with them. Because again, the problem is the longer we're saved, the less non-Christian friends we have, right? And, and sometimes we don't even have any non-Christian friends, right? Uh, but we have to strategically make friendships with unsaved people because Jesus, what was, it, what was said about Jesus? He's a friend of sinners, amen? He was always hanging out with sinners, right? The Pharisees were always bothered that he was, doesn't he know who that person is, right? And so we have to strategically uh, just, you know, ask the Lord, God, who can I uh, befriend uh, so that I can, I can win them to the Lord? Uh, when we, um, yeah, when I pastored in Dudley, Massachusetts, uh, you know, I would go out into the neighborhood and introduce myself to the, to the neighbors, right? And uh, there was a, a lady across the road from me, and I'd, I'd been just, you know, there a couple of months, and I knocked on the door, introduced myself, said, I'm the pastor of the church across the road, and she said to me, it's about time you showed up, you know? You know, I, I mean, she just had that sense of humor. I said, well, I just got here, so... Anyway, I found out that she was German. She was actually from Germany. And uh, she had come just after the Second World War. And uh, she was uh, Lutheran. And when she arrived in, in Dudley, Massachusetts, someone came to the door and said, you know, we, we know you're from Germany. We know you're Lutheran. But you can't come to our church unless someone comes and invites you. And no one ever came and invited her. So I don't, know, I don't know what kind of church that, obviously it doesn't exist, exist anymore because you're not going to grow if you do that. But, uh, but I, I, I did the EE with her, the Evangelist Explosion, and uh, a letter to the Lord. And then I would come over and visit her and she would always hold up the track and say, I still, I have the track, I read the track all the time. So, you know, I, I, you know it's it just like, Lord, who would you want me uh, to just, be a friend to, right, in order to possibly have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Amen. So God, God, when you might concern for the lost, right, when you might concern for the lost. The second thing that we need to uh, ask the Holy Spirit to renew in us is our commitment to give. Okay, our commitment to give, right? You know, this is, I mean, you've got to practice there. You've got three offerings there. That's, that's, that's a lot of offerings. Amen. So you're, you're, getting, you're getting thrown right into the deep end today. But um, renew my commitment to give. You know, Paul, this, is, this is incredible because Paul says about the Church of Philippians, he says, Nobody shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving Except you only. So we have this picture of the, the New Testament church as perfect. But notice what Paul says. He says, you know, I asked other churches to support me, but they wouldn't. The only one that supported me is you. He says, no one else partnered with me in this matter of giving and receiving except you only. Why is that? Well, notice the order. No one else partnered with me in the matter of giving and receiving. Which came first? Giving, amen? He says, no one partnered with me in this giving and receiving except you only because everybody else, it's receiving and then giving, right? But the Bible says it's more blessed to give than receive. Why is that? Why is it more blessed to give than receive, right? Well, Paul tells us. He says, he says in verse 8, he says in verse 17, not that I am looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. In other words, it's more blessed to give than receive because every one of us has an account in heaven. And Paul says, you know, I, I'm not... I, Thank you for the gift. Thank you for sharing in my troubles. But you know what? What I'm more thankful for is now it is going to be to your credit. Okay. All right. So it's more blessed to give than receive because something happens in the supernatural realm. I get a credit with God. 
right? Which brings me to the third point, and I'm, I'm going to tell you what this credit is, right? So, renew my commitment to, I'm sorry, renew my concern for the lost, renew my commitment to give, and then this is the, this is the most important of the three. Renew my confidence in the Lord to provide, right? Because that's, that's the foundation of, of anything, is, uh, uh, is, my conf is my trust in the Lord to provide. Now, what are the three things that the Lord is going to provide in this portion of Scripture? Remember, Paul says, I'm looking for something that can be credited to your account, right? The, these are the, when, when you and I have a concern for the lost, when you and I are committed to give, whether it be financially or whether it be our talent or our time uh, towards reaching the lost, Paul says three things are credited to your account. First of all, contentment, right? He says, I have learned the secret of contentment, amen? When you and I are on the same page as the Lord, the first thing he gives us is contentment. Right? The second thing Paul says that the Lord will give to us is strength. He says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen? Because if we're going to reach out to lost people, if we're going to move with concern, uh, we can't do that in our own strength, right? I mean, we can only go so far if it's our strength. But if it's the Lord's strength, we can go farther and farther than we can ever think or imagine. Amen? And then the last thing he, he says is, you know, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So the third thing that the Lord, we can be confident in the Lord to provide, and that is resources. Amen? We can provide resources. God will provide all the resources we need if they're being used to reach lost people. Amen? And so the issue is because what can often happen is, okay, okay, God, you said that you provide contentment, that you provide strength, that you provide the resources, provide them, and then I'll show concern for the lost. And it doesn't work like that. It's as we move with concern, God provides, amen? God provides. As, as we move with concern. You know, we, we, we did a missions trip to Scotland um, and um, we were uh, working uh, on just renovating the building and uh, we, ran out of, um, we ran out of pipe. Uh, one of the guys in our group was installing like uh, copper piping and, um, and so what he, what he had to do then is he had to take uh, a piece that we had bought that was the wrong size and bring it back like to a, like a Home Depot um, and, you know, get the money and then hope that we could get enough uh, to buy the smaller pipes that he needed. But there was no way. We didn't have enough money. So we're walking through the parking lot going into the Home Depot um, in Glasgow, Scotland. And next thing I, we hear this voice. Hey, what are you doing with that pipe? And we're like looking around and there was a van with an older guy there. And we were like, well, we're just returning it. And we're going to uh, you know, get our money back and hopefully buy what we need. And he says, oh, I, I have pipe at my house. Okay. Yeah, I'll just, just go get the money. Return the pipe and I'll sell you the pipes. So we go, Abraham, he goes in and gets the money. And then... This total stranger, we get, we get in the van with him, and, uh, and we're driving through these side streets in Glasgow, and I'm trying to share the gospel with him. Uh, he, he's not interested, and I'm like, nobody knows we're with this guy, and uh, we pull up to a side street into like his home, and he's got a shed, and all the pipes that we need are in the shed. And he just takes the money that we got from the other pipe. You know. I mean, only God can do something like that, right? The guy's not even interested in the God. He only wants to make money. 
he's got this pipe and that he wants to get rid of, and he just wants the money, you know. So that's the kind of God that we serve, amen? But we only find that out when we're moved with concern for the lost, amen? And so, uh, you know, for those of you who are going on, on to Haiti or thinking about going to Haiti, yeah, that's an expression of concern for the lost, amen? That's an expression of your commitment to give. And I don't know what the cost is, but if God wants you there, He will provide, amen? He will provide. You be obedient. You just say, I want to go, and the Lord will provide, amen? Amen. Thank you so much uh, for just listening and uh, just, just pray that, you know, um, we maybe come back in four or five years. I mean, we just, we'll just see the, the whole community uh, at least have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Amen. So thanks so much. God bless you. Amen. All right, Mr. Byron, leader of Evangelism Explosion in the days ahead. If anybody pulls up with a van and says, follow me to my shed, just pray first, make sure it's a God thing. Now, it is cool how the Lord works. You know, I'm not a mathematician by any means, but 6.3 million people and about 100,000 have any claim of allegiance to Christ. That's just over one-tenth of one percent. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Number one is we pray the Lord's blessing over you folks as you go into a very tough community and tough area spiritually. You know, we, we really don't think of places like Ireland as being a tough place to reach, but when you really consider one-tenth of one percent of the population, and when you think of that, we're not that far behind here in New England. I think it was your line this morning, Patrick, that if you can minister here, you can minister in Europe. It's very similar in many, many respects. And, you know, when, when he was a young man in Ireland, maybe 95% of the people had any kind of a claim to faith. And now it's down to that. I can tell you, Taryn, I'm going to borrow one of your numbers, among the newer generations, it's down to 3 or 4%. So there's this decline that's happening. But I believe that the Lord is also capable of doing incredible things. And I love the fact that we can get behind you and your family and support the work. And I want to share a verse with you that I tend to share when missionaries come through, written by the same author that you quoted extensively this morning, the Apostle Paul. And I'm actually borrowing one of the verses that you alluded to. It says the following, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But he continues, How then can they call on the one they have not yet believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As a follower of Christ, and as followers of Christ, we all have a role to play in that grand scheme. We are all called to be witnesses. Please don't think that just Patrick and his family are missionaries. They are uniquely called to go to a nation, specifically, but we are all called somewhere. I look across this room, I see, I see all kinds of witnesses to all kinds of communities, to all kinds of age levels, to all different manner of venues, whether it be middle school, high school, elementary school, the job place homeschooling and beyond. We are called to be witnesses. But we're also called to give and we're also called to sow into the ministries of those who are the ones who are going. How can Patrick go to Ireland unless he has sent, unless there are people back here who are willing to support him? So this morning we have an opportunity to do exactly that. So ushers, if you would come forth, I want to say if you are going to give via check, please make the check payable to New Life Assembly of God and we'll just cut him one check, but we're going to pray. And then we're going to collect. Father, we pause, and in the midst of our own personal busyness, as we are overwhelmed by our own personal concerns or family concerns or concerns regarding the things in our day to day lives, there is a greater concern that I pray that you would open our hearts to. And that's a concern for those who don't know you. Lord, Patrick asked on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your concern for the lost? And Lord, if we were to truly give a number to that, I think we would, we would be dismayed at where it really is. But wherever we are, God, on that spectrum, 
that you would intensify our passion for those who don't know you. Because God, it's bigger than just us in this room and it's bigger than just the churches. There is a mission that you have called us to. And there are people that you have placed in our lives that you are, that you are calling us, inviting us to reach. Help us to do that. And God, this morning, as we, as we have an opportunity to give to someone and to a family that is going to help plant a church in Ireland, God, that you would be with them in a mighty way. Lord, that you would empower them, that you would strengthen them, that they would have every resource, earthly, supernatural, and beyond, to do the work that you have called them to do. Keep them in health, add your favor and blessing. Put the right people around them, God, to advance the work of your kingdom. You already have the plan and everything lined up. Help them to be faithful, to walk through every open door. And Lord, I pray that you would bless this offering as we choose to give. In Jesus Christ's name. And everyone says, Amen. Well,